Hi, we're speaking to Professor Joel Irish from Liverpool John Moores University. He's a dental anthropologist. Thank you again for being here, Joel. Um, Thank you. Could you tell us a bit about what dental anthropology is? Well, dental anthropology is essentially all things teeth as they pertain to us humans, but also our ancestors like uh, earlier species of Homo, Australopithecus and so forth to some degree, and also to uh, our relatives, uh, great apes, monkeys and so forth. But mainly it's focused on humans. And dental anthropology started, uh, I would say, maybe in the 1950s, technically, uh, as a subfield of biological anthropology. And it became more specialized because as time goes by, everything's becoming more specialized. So we have people that are specialists on the feet, on the hands, on the skull, and in my case, on the teeth. And teeth are incredibly informative for a number of reasons. First off, uh, the teeth themselves, the enamel and so forth, are the hardest tissue in the human and other, other animals' bodies. So they're more likely to survive the fossil record and the archaeological record to be studied in the first place. In fact, a lot of species are based, uh, earlier species, are based largely only on teeth because they survived and the rest of the skeleton is gone through di diagenesis. So again, because they're there, we might as well study them. But what's also important is that teeth are very useful for a number of other reasons. Uh, for one, they're the only hard tissue that comes in contact with the environment. Uh, everything else, obviously, is covered by flesh. So we can tell what an individual ate based on the type of dental wear. We can tell if they had cavities, if they were eating high, uh, high sugar types of foods. Uh, we can tell based on the type of uh, angling in the wear whether they were agriculturalists or if there was flatware, if they're more plant eaters, hunter gatherers, and so forth. So you can tell based on that. Um, you can also tell individual behavior, which is of use, for example, in forensic uh, situations. So let's say uh, we know that Uncle Harry used to smoke a pipe, and then we find a body. Is this Uncle Harry? Like and yeah, then there's like a pipe facet. Well, that's a pretty good indication. Or like I said uh, in a previous interview, <laughs> that my uh, a friend of mine used to open beer bottles with his teeth, and so he broke all of the crowns off. So that's a good way of indicating that this person is, in this case, Chuck. Um, but the, what's really interesting about teeth uh, overall is that they have such an incredibly high genetic component in their expression. And not only the expression of, for example, the size of the teeth, but also the morphology, the different bumps and grooves and so forth that appear on the surface of the teeth. Uh, studies have found in many cases that the heritability is up to 80%, only 20% environmental. And so what that means is because they're so highly genetic in their makeup, they can be used as proxies for uh, genetic studies. Now obviously in this case we're talking about fossil hominins. This is Australopithecus sediba. And this is all fossilized. So there's no way we're going to get DNA out of this material. So the next best thing is to look at the hard tissue remains that have the highest genetic component, and that's teeth. And so by doing that, we can determine, this again going back to dental anthropology, we can determine if this individual is more closely related to another individual, like say in a forensic case, or if we have these different features on the surface of a sample of teeth, let's say uh, a population from the New World, and we can compare that to a sample of a population from Northeast Asia, and they have a high amount of similarity, we can tell that the two are closely related to one another compared to example of uh, African populations or European populations. So the high genetic component allows the ability to look for relatedness not only uh, at the same time like between different world populations but through time to see what the ancestry is. And there's a whole variety of other features uh, like I said pathology, genetics, uh, forensic uses and so forth so bottom line, as I've told my students many times, half-jokingly, is that you can throw the rest of the skeleton away and just keep the teeth because you can, determine, <laughs> you can determine the age of the individual very precisely up until they're uh, a young adult. You can determine, in some cases, the sex of the individual, although that's obviously not the best way to go. So you've got age, sex, uh, individual features, uh, you name it, you can do it with teeth. So that's why I do it. That's great. Yeah. 
love to. Um, yes, you should. <laughs> so um, your recent paper was looking at the Sediba um, specimen. Yes, this, um, this fellow right here. Could you tell us a bit more about the metrics were taken to basically understand how related it was to other hominins? Okay, so this is a fossil cast, obviously, of Australopithecus sediba. There's the mandible. I'll put these yeah. guys together. You can see here's the side view and front view. Fairly primitive looking. You can see they got a relatively tiny brain, about one third the size of us folk. Uh, quite a large face, uh, fairly large teeth. But overall, this species dates back to almost two million years ago, about 1.97 million years ago. So yes, we did a paper uh, with some colleagues of mine, um, from Brian Hempel from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, Daryl DeRuder from Texas A&M University, and Professor Lieberger from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, who, by the way, along with his son and faithful dog, I don't remember the dog's name, found the fossils from this species, Australopithecus sediba, approximately six years ago. So anyway, a lot of work has been done already on this uh, skeleton, on these particular remains. This one is MH1, if I didn't mention already, I don't remember. You have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> MH1, uh, which is from a young male, would have been about, oh, 14 years of age or so. And then we have another fossil, the other main fossil, which is from the MH2 specimen, and it's from an adult female. And there's some other remains as well. But bottom line, this uh, species has been studied quite a bit so far. It does uh, bear the name of a new species because it is so different from previous uh, Australopithecus africanus in South Africa. But uh, I previously did a study of the dental morphology, as I mentioned, the, the surface features, the cusps, the groove patterns, and whatnot. And we did this in a paper that came out in Science in 2013. And based on this, we did a cladistic study and determined that this species is very similar uh, to Homo, but yet it also looks very Australopithecus-like, like, like uh, Australopithecus africanus, which would make absolute sense. So now what we're doing, and what I did instead, is to focus on the size, the dental metrics, not the morphology, but the size. And size itself is not necessarily informative depending on what the question is. So like, okay, you got big honking teeth or you got little teeth, that doesn't tell you much. So what I was doing is something called two size apportionment analysis, where you look at the relative size of the teeth. Uh, like for example, uh, are these molars long and narrow? Are they wide and short? Uh, and also, because it is called two size apportionment analysis, it is, the question is where is the size apportioned within the dentition? not only in the individual, but in the overall sample of the species. So for example, in modern humans, uh, the apportionment of our teeth, uh, they're larger in the front and smaller relative to the back. And that's because we have been eating a much softer diet lately uh, for the past several thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and millions of years in the genus of Homo. Whereas other species, for example, Paranthropus, which is our ancient dead-end ancestor that died off about perhaps a million years ago, 1.2 million years ago, had just the opposite pattern. Very large teeth in the back, very small teeth in the front because they were eating more plant matter, rough plant matter. So they needed these massive grinding teeth to, to grind this material down. So what we can do is by telling where the teeth are apportioned, we can tell where Homo, excuse me, in this case, <laughs> not Homo, Australopithecus sediba, where it fits in. I'm saying Homo because some recent studies have suggested that it should be in the genus Homo. Uh, Lee Berger believes it is Australopithecus, and I think it is too. But it is clearly showing a mosaic of both Australopithecus and Homo features. And what we found is that these guys, Australopithecus sediba, have smaller back teeth than their ancestors do, have larger front teeth, and Overall, especially in the third, what they call the third molar, or the, actually the first molar, uh, and the canines being smaller, and the size, especially of the anterior teeth, they look more like Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and to a lesser extent ourselves, than, say, they do to Australopithecus africanus. So what we ended up finding by based on this overall morphology, or the size, is that these could be... Uh, on the ancestral line to Homo, 
or at least are closely related to Homo, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and then to us. So this new study has shown, I think, quite nicely that these species, this species of Homo sediba, or I said it again, <laughs> Australopithecus sediba, because Time people think it's Homo <laughs> sediba, should be in the genus Homo, because it is very much like us. And so I think that's kind of what our study is finding. So it's, but it's not been moved into the genus Homo? No, it clearly won't be. It's, it's got too many Australopithecine features. It still has the curved face, uh, the still relatively large teeth, small cranial capacity. As you can see, it's only about a third the size <laughs> cranial capacity that you are, or that I am. So it's very primitive in many ways, but it also shows a lot of modern features. So it's got a real mosaic of ancient and modern like us. Very unique, very interesting species. They would have been short, too, as long as I'm at it, probably about this tall. Um, like I said, there are certain features that look very homo-like, but then there's other features that look very primitive. These guys still would have been able to climb around in the trees quite a bit. So, But anyway, they were on their way to being more like modern uh, homo uh, and earlier species of homo. Quite interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. Just before you go, could you give us a bit more information about this guy, Homo Naledi? Okay. Because everybody's heard of him of Homo naledi recently. Lee Berger again found this, so he's really on a roll. Lee Berger from the University of Witwatersrand. So he finds him and his son and his dog find uh, Australopithecus sediba back in around 2010. Three years later, they are uh, told about this new species. It's a very interesting situation. He was, uh, Lee Berger was woken late at night, uh, or he was about to go to bed, I guess. Someone knocks on his door and said, hey, we found some bones in a cave. Would you be interested? And of course, he would be interested. So what they found, uh, some spelunkers or cavers who are crazy enough to crawl into really confined spaces, <laughs> and in this case, they were in something called the Rising, Ca uh, Rising Star Cave System, and particularly in what they call now the Dinaletti Chamber, they found skeletal remains on the, on the ground. Getting into the cave is incredibly difficult. Uh, you have to purposely want to go in the cave, and you have to be very small, very thin, and crazy to go into this cave. <laughs> Once they got into the cave, they, like I said, they found skeletal remains all over the place. And so they took some pictures, showed it to Lee, and he was very excited. And so the Rising Star Expedition came about in uh, about 2013, and so they collected remains from this. Check on the website, National Geographic website, and you'll see all the background about uh, recovering the remains. Uh, but anyway, then uh, Lee put together uh, a group of 30 people from all around the world, mainly young researchers who were just starting out, and then a few older geezers like us to help move things along. And we studied the entire set of remains, which was about 1,550 individual bones from just a small area of the cave. There's a lot more left in there which would have been about the, at least a minimum of 15 individuals. And so we had specialists brought in that focused on the feet, on the legs, on the pelvis, on the, the thorax, the arms and the skull, and then I and several other individuals were focusing on the teeth. <clears throat> My focus again was on dental morphology and to a lesser extent on metrics. And so, uh, what was it, two years ago, one year ago? We had an article come out in eLife, led by Lee Berger, that described this new species. And we believe, and he believes, that it is in the species, uh, excuse me, the genus Homo. Uh, it clearly, it's got a small brain once again. It's about the same size as that of Australopithecus sediba, so they're quite similar in cranial capacity. Uh, again, about one third the size of us, modern humans. But yet they've got features of the skull that look, for example, something like Homo erectus. Uh, their hands are very modern in that they could probably make stone tools, but yet their finger bones are curved. And also their shoulder is such that they were probably still able to climb in the trees quite a bit. But then they had very long legs and their feet were very modern. The pelvis less so. So they're, again, they're like this mosaic. They have a little bit of modern, a little bit of... Uh, primitive features. We don't yet know the date, although I, I can say we have an inclination of what the date is. I just can't. I can tell you, but then I would have to kill you. Okay, don't so tell me. <laughs> there is a 
there should be some new uh, uh, evidence for the dates coming up, but I can't go into that. But it's going to be very interesting. So watch out for that. <laughs> well, watch out, yes, watch out for that. So anyway, what I was doing with these other people is that we were studying the skeleton as a whole. So we were all together in one massive room, certain people focusing on the feet, like I said, the teeth and so forth. And so unlike the story of the visually impaired men or blind men who were feeling different parts of the elephant, you know, the elephant oh, yeah. is this based on the tail, this based on the trunk, we did it all together and could at that point tell that it's clearly in the genus Homo. It's modern enough as far as that goes, yet it does again show that it was descended from Australopithecines. But clearly Homo and clearly a new species because of the small cranial capacity and the possibility also that it may have made stone tools, that it could based on the hands. So anyway, what I'm doing with other researchers at this point, there's about 12 of us now, we have come together, or we came together in South Africa earlier this summer, and we'll be doing a compendium on the entire thing about the dentition. So we've got people that are doing CT scanning, we've got people that are looking at pathology, that we're looking at perichymata, uh, which has the growth lines yeah. on the teeth, which is one of um, your <laughs> yeah, it's one part of your my interests. project. Yeah. Uh, and others are doing dental size, and again, I'm focusing on morphology. So currently, I'm working on a paper with several others. We're also looking at the deciduous or baby teeth of the species. And again, I'm doing the same thing that I did for earlier for Australopithecus sediba to try to figure out more definitively where these guys fit in, how they are related to us, how they are related to earlier species of Homo, where they fit on the family tree. So that's what I'm working on right now that's with this species. Very exciting. Thank you again for joining us. Um, we'll put a link to um, both Joel's most recent paper and also the National Geographic work on um, Homo Um Thank you again and for Sadiba. joining us. And Sadiba, yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye.